Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Senate Education. It's Thursday, April 15th at 1.37 p.m. Uh, we are going to start by, uh, or actually our first two priorities have to do with the State Board of Education. Uh, we have uh, Senator uh, Rahm and Representative Christie with us to help us uh, work on the language that uh, we worked on yesterday as it relates to diversifying the State Board. We then have two of the governor's appointments, uh, Mr. Lovett and Mr. Jepson, both with us uh, for um, their hearings uh, to join the state board. And then later in the afternoon, we'll return to S-114 and uh, Mr. Demaray will take us through the house changes to our literacy bill. Uh, and we'll also hear from the secretary, uh, Secretary French and Ms. Myers on their feedback as to where we are at with that. So we don't have ledge council at this moment, but I believe um, uh, Senator Rahm, welcome. Representative Christie, welcome. Good to see both of you. We appreciate you being here. I didn't realize that Senator Rahm is the co-chair of the Social Equity Caucus. Uh, so um, great having you with us. Uh, Representative Christie, can you hear us okay? I think he's still, they, I can tell you as his co-chair in the Social Equity hey. Caucus, he has some technical difficulties sometimes just with the headset and the you sure. know, Hartford connection. So yep. okay. a moment. So why don't we start with you, Senator Rahm? Um, I believe Jeannie sent you uh, some language last evening. And uh, let me see, I think it is up on our website as well. We all just want to get there. This is language that we worked on yesterday afternoon. Um, and again, as you know, just to, to bring those who uh, may not recall, or those watching us for the first time, we did receive a very thoughtful letter from the Social Equity Caucus asking how going forward we can think about and work to uh, ensure that the State Board of Education uh, is representative of all Vermonters, sort of the Vermont today and the Vermont of the future and make us uh, the state where uh, a wide range of people want to um, uh, live, work, and make their make their livelihood. So, with that, uh, Senator Rahm, uh, have you had an opportunity to look at the language? I have. I have. Terrific. Terrific. Um, and uh, and I'm sorry. I'm just looking here. I know Jeannie probably has it up. There it is. Yep. Okay. Senator Rahm, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. For the record, Senator Keisha Rahm from Chittenden County. Um, I'm um, grateful to be present um, with your committee along with Mr. Lovett and Mr. Jepson. Um, it gives me the opportunity to say uh, to both of them that this is certainly nothing personal. Uh, it's not in any way questioning your professional credentials or the perspectives you bring, or even that you care about the young people of Vermont. Um, you know, but we wrote that letter out of a concern that overall the Board of Education is becoming increasingly less diverse of perspectives that are really necessary to advance the well being of uh, Vermont's learners. Um, we, I want to say, I recognize that the St. Johnsbury area, Bennington County, you know, these are areas that have high, uh, high poverty, high um, ratios of, of families who access free or reduced lunch. Um, those are also counties that already have representation on the Board of Education. And that comes at a time when certain large counties and communities have zero representation, but a, a, a large share of our state's uh, learners and young people. Um, so I wanted to start by, by saying that we have a, a growing concern about the diversity of the Board of Education. And there's good reason for that. In case the committee hasn't heard this statistic before, hi coach, um, in, in case the, the committee hasn't heard this statistic before, um, uh, when you look at the state's diversity in terms of, of racial breakdown, um, Vermont has a, a, you know, a population of about 6% BIPOC folks. And that's 90% you know, of the population growth in the state in the last decade has come from people of color. So when you break that down further, that's, that's about 3% of people over the age of 65 are BIPOC, but 10% of our school kids 
So the diversity of our school children overall um, is supersedes the overall BIPOC diversity of our state. Um, so, you know, I just want to say, you know, as you think about populations that are um, in, in many ways left behind that, that it, you know, if they're not given the resources and fair treatment in schools tend to bring down test scores and, you know, other um, quality indicators because they're not having their needs met. And that, you know, is a mark against our entire education system. Um, then we end up, you know, in a sort of spiral when we, it was highly preventable to make sure that you have diverse set of voices who can speak to the needs of a diverse group of learners and start to ensure that all students are getting what they need. So specific to the language as it, you know, um, for those viewing who might not have seen the language as I understand it, instead of just articulating that the State Board of Education needs to have geographic diversity, it speaks to geographic diversity, gender diversity, racial diversity, and ethnic diversity. I think that's an incredible step in the right direction um, to really sending a message to the administration, the governor, whoever they may be, that this is a really critical step to making sure that our Board of Education is more reflective of all of those elements um, you know, of diversity. I also, you know, it wasn't something that came up in our letter, but gender diversity is really important too, because a lot of our 75% of our teachers are, are identified as women, you know, so we have a lot of women in our schools um, and yet not as many women on the board of education. Um, so, you know, we were just looking at some trends where we saw some overrepresentation from people at independent schools as opposed to public schools. And, um, you know, less diversity of who's educating our kids, who's in our schools, et cetera. And that does not bode well for ensuring quality across the board at all of our learning institutions. You're on mute, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and so um, with that change, uh, and uh, I don't know, um, you, certainly you, you have time. We're going to probably officially vote this, I would think, early next week and send it back uh, or send it to the House on one of their bills because we do believe this is a priority that should be addressed this year. Um, are you comfortable with the language change that we've made? I am. You know, I, I think there are there are too many laundry lists we could get into um, sure. you know, if we tried to articulate some, you know, a lot of identity differences, but I actually think it captures the spirit of saying we need to be paying attention to demography, you know, identity, lived experience, perspective when we when we do this, which was already in the law. It said that you have to take into account geographic perspective and, and difference. And, you know, that was for a reason. There was an, an intent there to say you can't stack the board with a certain county or a certain perspective. And so this, I think, um, evolves that language to meet 21st century learning needs. Um, I would also say, to be fair, often we talk about racial and ethnic diversity as just benefiting those who are black or brown kids, right? Those who identify as the learners who are sometimes underrepresented um, in, in who's making decisions. But we are in an increasingly global community where you know, I was just talking to a young woman over, over lunch, helping her figure out which college she's gonna go to. And she wants diversity wherever she goes. You know, she wants a global community. She wants um, you know, a world-class education. And that means having a, a lens that is diverse, that has um, an equity perspective, because that's what is going to help you be successful in college and in the rest of the country. Thank you, Senator Rahm. Appreciate that. Any questions at this point for Senator Rahm before we turn to Representative Christie and then the chair of the state board, Mr. Carroll? Okay, Representative Christie, great to have you with us again and thank you for your time last week as we uh, dove into this. Um, appreciate your leadership and uh, um, wondering if you might want to weigh in on the language that we are proposing as well. Um, I think. Senator Rahm uh, did a very good job on uh, explaining where we're at today. Um, if we were to go into uh, every facet of our statutes, 
Uh, and you recall when we did the uh, revision of Title 16, when you and I were both on House Ed, uh, that's, that's a pretty intensive, labor intensive uh, operation. But I, th I think that there are times in our history where we have an opportunity. I look at this, you know, as does the Senator, as an opportunity to express our intentionality as a state that all of our kids matter. You would say, well, how could you be involved in education and not think that? Well, there are times that there is a separation and whether intentional or otherwise, it's there. So when we have the opportunity to uh, clearly state what we feel as the elected leaders of the state of Vermont need to be reflected you know, within our institutions. Our fellow Vermonters will understand. And, and I think that Senator Rahm, as I said before, did a very good job explaining the demographic and the statistical components of why. But from the other perspective, just the social uh, perspective, thinking back to a statement, you know, of Dr. King, where he refers to when we raise or one is affected, we are all intrinsically affected. So this good action will have incredible ramifications in a positive way for the state of Vermont. And um, I guess that's all I'd like to, to share. And I really appreciate the work of uh, uh, Senate Ed in moving this forward. Thank you, Representative Christie, very much. And thank you again for, for raising uh, the issue. Uh, before we move on to uh, Chair Carroll, uh, any questions for Representative Christie? Mr. Carroll, good afternoon. Great to have you with us, and we appreciate uh, you may get our Star Witness Award this year, uh, depending on how the rest of the session goes. We contacted uh, Mr. Carroll uh, not too long ago, and he was able to uh, join us. Um, but uh, we really, in all sincerity, appreciate it and appreciate you weighing in on this language. You are the leader of the state board, and we certainly uh, want to have uh, your support and eyes on this. So. With that, please. And you are muted, uh, Mr. Carroll. That, that's how my wife prefers me to be generally. Oh. Um, <laughs> muted. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board and Senator Rahm and Coach, nice to see you again, sir. Um, for the record, I'm John Carroll, chair of the state board. I. I did have to change some things around to join you, and I'm really glad to have the opportunity to do so. I, Thank you. I, I, love, I love what I see here. Um, I, I just think this is a, a, not an obvious improvement, but it's a heck of an improvement. And um, I guess it is obvious, but if it's, if it's so obvious, why didn't we do it before? Uh, in any case, I'm delighted to see this, and I can't imagine that, uh, well, I can't imagine that anybody on the board would feel otherwise. Um, so, uh, uh, of course, the the work of this is the governor's responsibility. Um, we're not a self-selecting group. We always wait in great, a little bit like the night before Christmas, kind of uh, what is the going to who's the governor going to give us this time? Um, and so, um, uh, and it's it's always a, a surprise, and we're always. Uh, uh, happy with it. Um, so um, I guess I would just have to say that diversity is something that I've, uh, I've come to learn to value and I'm using diversity in the broadest possible sense. Uh, economic diversity, 
gender, racial, and international. Um, and where I learned the value of diversity actually was in my service in the Senate, which of course was so long ago that most of you were in high school when I was there. Um, but but what I what I learned from six years there was that we were better when we were together, and that that it, it was the it was the incarnation of synergy. You know, synergy means that the sum is greater than the that the, the total or the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and that I used to be astonished at, in meetings of committees when somebody very different than I would just say something that was so insightful and would cause us all to sit up and say, oh, I never thought of that. And we were better for it and our work was better for it. So I came to have this uh, love affair with diversity of all sorts. And uh, so this is all part of that. I just would uh, add some, I hope, clarification about the makeup of the board. Um, in 2002, uh, 2000, 2020, last year, the governor made four, uh, I think four appointments, one student, two new members replacing people who had termed out and another member replacing somebody who had uh, left before their term was done. And of the four appointees, all four were, were women. Um, so the notion that the board is balanced toward men is not uh, factually accurate. Uh, of the present makeup of the, as you know, there are 11 members of the board, one of whom is ex officio, that is to say, the Secretary of Education. Uh, that person is in a sort of class unto uh, her or himself. Um, the remaining 10 are citizens, ordinary people. Um, some with education backgrounds and some not. Um, and of the 10 of us now, six are women and four are men. So I, I, uh, there seems to be some misunderstanding about the gender makeup of the board and uh, that those are the simple facts of the matter. Um, uh, as to the, Somehow there's this talk about an affiliation with private schools, I'm not sure, or independent schools, I'm not sure just what that means. I do know that one uh, recently appointed member has a background in education in independent schools and another board member who's been on for a couple of years uh, was formerly a member of the board of directors of an independent school. That's two out of the 10 uh, that have some connection to independent school. I'm not aware of any other connections and you certainly wouldn't be able to ascertain it from listening to us talk. Um, so I, I guess uh, in, in, in some, I would just say that one of the virtues of the board is its diversity. And I think this amendment to uh, existing statute will uh, memorialize that and help to remind governors when they make appointments that this is something that they need to be uh, uh, attending to. The board is, has, is not and never has been an assemblage of special interests or stakeholders. There have been times to change the board that way. In fact, I think Senator Campion, you'll remember when you were in the house in 2012 and the passage of Act 98, there was a proposal to make the board consist of a representative of the teachers union and a representative of the school boards association, a sort of a, a cluster of stakeholders. And that was by the legislature rejected as an approach. Uh, the board is a pretty mixed bag of people. Some people who, who actually have had involvement in schools sometimes as classroom teachers and otherwise as administrators or leaders. And, but for people like me, uh, other than serving on my local school boards um, and going to school <laughs> and having had wonderful teachers, that's all I know about education. So um, I think that diversity actually is rich in just the same way you are, in the same way that the General Assembly is made up of an, of an mar marvelous amalgam of of Vermonters from all walks and all backgrounds, 
all intellectual disciplines. And the result is the synergy that, that comes from diversity. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think we are we have some uh, some agreement around language, uh, uh, and I'm looking to the committee to see if committee members have any final questions on this topic uh, at this point or comments. So not seeing any. Uh, please, Senator Hooker. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Campion, and thank you, Mr. Carroll. I have a question for you regarding the previous appointments, the four appointments. Do you recall what the makeup of the board was then before the four women were appointed? Let's see. Um, the, I'm just trying to remember who replaced whom. Um, I think it was there, there was, uh, oh yeah, there was one student member who was who was a male, a, a, a young man, who was replaced by one of our present student members. Mm -hmm. uh, who, by the way, and this is, I'm, I'm a little unsure about this because I haven't had a chance to chat with her, but I think she would identify as Hispanic, by the way, mm -hmm. for what it's worth. Um, uh, and then the other members to your question, Senator Hooker, uh, a woman replaced a man, I remember. And I, I think that um, it, I think it took the balance from being about equal between male and female to being slightly advantaged for females, okay. slightly. And, and Not, but, you. but I wasn't, you notice I wasn't counting. <laughs> right, and that's good. Um, and secondly, is there is this a, a strict appointment? I was I wondered if there was an application, if people requested to be on the board, or is this uh, just a strict appointment from the governor? Oh, oh well, it, it's it's certainly that. I mean, it's based upon the governor's judgment. Um, um, I. I think that there is some mechanism on the website for people to indicate their interest. And as I understand it, this year, the governor's office did put out a, a press release or something notifying folks of these vacancies. In fact, I got calls from maybe a half dozen folks who'd heard those public service announcements oh, and sorry. called me to say, what's it take? What's it like? And so on and so forth. And in every case, um, um, you know, I, I just tried to be helpful. So, so I think it's a, a mixed bag of the, the governor may know somebody that he has in mind for this, or they're, they, they get brought to the governor's office attention, or they may, uh, you can ask these two coming up uh, yeah. how that works. It's a mixed bag. Okay, thank you. And maybe, maybe our uh, new members can right. test to that. Thanks. Right. And Senator Hooker, uh, Jeannie, uh, I think, has sent around an email response from the governor's office, also giving additional information if she, uh, on, on the process and the application and, and, and that information. So that hopefully will be helpful as well. Thank you. OK. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Representative Christie. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. And I know Senator Rahm needed to return to committee, uh, but I'd like to thank her as well. Um, Committee will, will add this, as I mentioned, to uh, some of our other work uh, and send it to the House sometime next week. Uh, and I will look to all of you if you have additional questions or edits before we get to that stage. Otherwise, I think we're, we're in good shape. So thank you. And Mr. Demaray, thank you as well for, for uh, providing us with that draft. Uh, Switching just slightly, but staying on the same uh, topic of our State Board of Education. Uh, welcome again, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Lovett and Mr. Jepson. Uh, great to have both of you with us. We have uh, decided as a committee that uh, we don't know if historically uh, state board members have come to committees. I think it might be a uh, nothing really uh, established where it's become a tradition, but we thought we would try to either start that tradition or uh, return to it 
given that your positions really do warrant uh, some time and some discussion. So uh, thanks for being with us. We really very much appreciate it. And what we thought we'd do is start with Mr. Lovett. Good to see you, Tom. Good to see you, Senator. Uh, and what we'd like to know really is uh, if you would be so kind as just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, uh, how you got to this position now, uh, wanting to be on the state board and you know, a little bit about some of your goals uh, uh, for the board and for yourself. And that I'm sure will stimulate some uh, conversation uh, amongst us. So thank you. Great. So first I wanna thank the committee for a chance to introduce myself. Uh, I know some of you from my days at Head, Headmaster and I've been in touch with some of you um, in this past year through my work at the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative, um, but there are some of you that I haven't met. And I also wanna thank Governor Scott for appointing me to the State Board of Education. And my hope today is that I will tell you a little bit about my background and experience, uh, my reasons for wanting to be on the board and my hope for my time on the board. Uh, Indulge me with just a little bit of personal history. Uh, I'm the oldest of two public school teachers. Uh, my mom started as a fifth grade teacher in Shelburne and ended as a preschool teacher after raising six children. My dad started as a high school teacher and coach in Pittsburgh, taught and coached in Shelburne and Bellows Falls. And then after being an assistant principal and athletic director in New Hampshire, returned to Vermont as athletic director and coach at Springfield. And I mentioned their lifelong vocation as teachers because it inspired me to follow in their footsteps. I uh, first was an engineering major, but decided after reflecting on their experience and what I saw through their teacher friends that I would enter education. Um, I gained through them important role models growing up and these teachers inspired me to strive to make a difference in the lives of young people and see education as more than academics, educating the whole person to be a constructive citizen and a person of good character. Um, they also taught me to care about those who struggle, to love those the most who need it the most. And that has been a motto at the core of my career um, for 40 years. Though at first I thought I wanted to teach at the university level, this drive to serve the people most in need drew me to high school teaching. I've chosen to work at schools that though independent have a public mission. Most of my career has been at St. Johnsbury Academy which serves about 40 to 50 communities in Vermont and Northern New Hampshire, as well as uh, students from 20 to 30 different countries. The Academy offers a comprehensive curriculum, not only the arts and, um, and academics, but also special education at all levels and career and technical education. It serves all kinds of learners at all levels of learning. It also um, serves a diverse student body in terms of nationality and race, religion, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and educational backgrounds. Uh, when I was head, it led efforts to serve refugee families and help students struggling with cognitive, physical, emotional, and mental health challenges. It has an endowed fund to provide resources for students living in poverty, a fund which I took particular care to grow and which has been invaluable during this pandemic. Situated in one of the most economically disadvantaged and rural parts of the state, the Academy offers anti-poverty and leadership development programs, like its Summer Youth Corps, which I specifically designed to help break the cycle of poverty. As a regional technical center, it offers also workforce development and adult education. And before I left as head, I helped secure space for an adult education workforce development center in the New Depot Square building in downtown St. Johnsbury. Plus recognizing that only through collective action and cross-sector collaboration can we transform systems. It has sponsored community outreach programs like the Community of Concern that I started in my first year's head and community arts programs to foster community vitality and healthy connections for young people and their families. Now I humbly recognize that the success of the Academy in doing all that it does so well is a result of collaboration and teamwork. It, it's not the headmaster's work. Um, I only mentioned this success as part of my background, so you can start to see where my values lie and the range of my experiences over the past 36 years. After retiring last June, I was fortunate to be asked to fill an interim role as director of the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative. I mentioned this experience because through it, I learned the power of collective action and the knowledge one can gain by gathering stakeholders and listening to the wisdom in the room. I also learned to appreciate both the uniqueness 
and the challenges of our rural communities and their schools. So this is a summary of what uh, I hope to bring to the State Board of Education, the knowledge, experience, skills, and values. I hope to make a positive difference in the lives of young people, their families, and their communities. I hope to be a good listener, identifying gaps in our systems and helping to bridge them. I especially hope to find ways to improve our systems to best serve those most in need. I decided to apply to be on the board because I see we're at an important and new moment in Vermont education. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed disparities and problems. It has shown the importance of mental health and school culture. It has highlighted the power of new technologies and opened up new possibilities for personalizing instruction. Also, the new societal consciousness of the critical need for diversity, equity, and inclusion also has exposed disparities and problems. It has brought us to consider questions of justice and access, recommitting ourselves to seeing the world through the lens of equity and inclusion. And it has highlighted the need to build healthy school communities within healthy larger communities. And finally, I decided to apply to be on the board because in response to the effects of the pandemic, I saw that abundant resources were coming to our state and communities, giving us a once in a lifetime or once in a generation opportunity for transformational change. So during my time on the board, I hope to do all I can to ensure a high quality, personally relevant educational experience to all students. For me, that means academics and culture and climate, curricular and extracurricular offerings, and opportunities that are personalized and community-based. I'd like to see Vermont's diverse educational landscape be a world-class model, and I believe that's possible. My drive to help accomplish it is somewhat per personal. Two of our five children are teachers, one in early education and one in secondary education. So I wanna help Vermont systems support high quality education of body, mind and spirit at all levels. I also have three grandchildren in public elementary school in Vermont, one receiving special education services. So I wanna help Vermont system to allow each of them to thrive, find his or her passion and pursue it with the resources and support each one needs. And finally, I remain committed to helping Vermont's communities develop a shared vision of and shared responsibility for a system of education that's sustainable and aspirational, equitable and accessible, and holistic and personalized for all. Again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to make this statement of introduction and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Lovett. Uh, if I may, I'm just going to kick it off. You've been, you know, um, in Vermont and in, in, in education now for, for a long time. And I know that St. John's Berry Academy, although sometimes uh, thought of as, uh, you know, an institution in some regards, similar to a Phillips Exeter or Andover, you are also a local public school. You are the local public school for St. John's Berry area. And so I, I think what I'm wondering is what, whether it comes from the state board or it comes from uh, the agency or it comes from this committee, what sort of, what area would you really see us uh, focusing on? I mean, we, as you may have heard, we're, we're working hard on literacy. We, we've identified that as an issue in our pre-K through third graders and even going on. Uh, I think that's certainly something we're going to continue to look at uh, next year as well. Uh, and I'm just other things that you can think of that you would see as priorities that, and for me, oftentimes it's those, those uh, maybe small changes that can make a big difference if you will. So I'll start um, really close um, to home in that right now I'm very concerned about the mental health of our, um, of our young people mm -hmm. um, and um, at all levels, not just high school, um, but I see it um, in the elementary uh, middle schools as well. So that would start there. That would be an area of focus of how we could support them. Um, it takes wraparound services we find in schools. And so um, um, many schools um, don't have the resources to provide wraparound services that will um, yield the mental health or the social emotional health uh, that, uh, that our young people need. So that's one thing that I would mention. I also think that there's, a, there's an opportunity um, for uh, personalized or performance-based, um, outcome-based assessment of a student learning. 
um, and um, to set uh, high quality uh, outcomes and to allow students to get there. Um, that aspect of our educational system, the assessment piece, I think also would be an area that, um, that I would pay attention to. I think that it's hard in rural communities to get um, the kind of internship uh, experience or the work uh, workplace uh, based learning that you can get in, in more populous areas. But I do think it's still possible to have a personalized and performance based um, educational system. Um, and then there's just the, the there's just the equity issue. Um, I, I, I think um, coming from the Northeast Kingdom, uh, I see families who struggle um, and to uh, getting broadband up here will be awesome. Um, it will be um, that will be an important issue, but there's also issues around housing and there's um, and early childhood programs and access to those things and transportation. And um, so I just think the more that we can um, level the playing field that we can help students who live um, who live in poverty, that would be another part that I would focus on. Thank you very much. And I appreciate, as you know, we have the chair of health and welfare on here, uh, Senator Lyons, who works hard on, on the mental health piece. And uh, so it's great that um, for you to share that. And, and I think we all recognize that as an issue as well. Uh, other questions, Senator Pershley. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thank you for, for being willing to serve on the board. And I, I really enjoyed our visit that we made up to St. Dunbury Academy last year. It's a very impressive institution. And I think anybody would be excited to have their, their child attend there. So I, the question is, which is kind of different, on how do you kind of see yourself taking that role from the headmaster of, of the academy to being on the board, kind of supporting all students throughout the state and then specifically kind of what, what do you think you as having that role of, at the academy or just these independent schools in general can provide to the whole state? Because, you know, to be direct, there's, there's people out there that feel that some of these independent schools are, are draining the public schools um, and that are, they're like stealing the kids or something like that. So I, I wondered if you could just speak to that, that issue. Um, I, I'll speak to the, the second part of what independent schools can provide. Um, and then I'll mention my own personal um, role. So I think independent schools um, are uh, mission-based and they're as close to a charter school as Vermont has, um, as a place to experiment with some things um, that might be good for the whole. Um, and I think that there are, there are things that happen in independent schools that, um, can benefit all, um, all educators. Um, I'm, I'm, well, I don't know enough to speak to the, um, the enrollment issue that you mentioned. I know that in St. Johnsbury anyways, we, um, it, that's not really the case where um, we are the, the school for surrounding 12 communities. Um, so I, um, I don't know by, from experience that. I will say that my experience with the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative um, uh, humbled me and I think uh, changed me in ways that I didn't expect and um, I'm in faster than I thought. It, having been somebody who was in charge of an organization and, the, um, the, and making decisions in a kind of CEO role and then moving to a Northeast Kingdom Collaborative as an interim director and the collaborative is a convener. It doesn't do the projects. It brings people together and we listen to the wisdom in the room from the experts and the people who do know, the stakeholders, try to help them come to some kind of consensus and, and understanding, and then go um, try to make those actionable by bringing resources to bear on those strategies and priorities. Um, I see that work very similar to the work of the state board. Um, gathering stakeholders, getting input from stakeholders, um, listening to the wisdom in the room, and then uh, as a group coming uh, together for a direction. Thank you. It is interesting and uh, there must be ways for, you know, the 
the general publics to learn from the independents and the independents to learn from the publics. I mean. And that is something I've, I've always been interested in uh, pulling apart. So I, I welcome any uh, conversation you might start at the state board around that, particularly around, you know, we, we want, uh, and I believe I'm speaking for the committee, you know, we would love to see Vermont become the place for teachers to teach, really. I mean, really the state that when you talk about the United States, people want to teach in Vermont. And, and it's something I know I'm interested in having summer conversations about and would certainly welcome those voices around how to get us there. And it's a complex question. Uh, you know, it does have the reality of it. It has something to do with money. It has to do with benefits. It has to do with a lot of things. But in general, those who are, are putting their names forward to be in the classroom, I, I do believe for the very most part, like physicians, there's a calling, there's something there that re they really want to do that work. Um, and I would love for us to get to the point where we compete for those best teachers, mm -hmm. uh, continue to compete for those best teachers. We have a lot of great teachers in the state um, and I want, want us to really build on that. I think that one thing I'll offer in that regard is my work on the um, Act 173 Census-Based Funding Advisory Group Mm -hmm. um, has been very collaborative and from people both from the independent and public school uh, communities. And um, that there's, there's been shared learning there um, as we share perspectives around how to serve the students who, um, who do need special services and um, who do need special education. So that group has done it. I know it's possible that there can be shared learning and conversations between both the independent school and the public school world. Thank you for that. Other questions, comments, Senator Lyons, please. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Lovett, for, for being here. Uh, your very thoughtful answers are extremely helpful. Uh, I, I do have a question about a couple of things. One, you mentioned wraparound services and the need for that within our schools. And, but that also then brings up uh, the distinction between social services and education and so do you have any thoughts about how to <laughs> meld the, what we're seeing for needs between, so, so picking mental health, uh, could be other areas of counseling or, or services. How do you see solving the problem uh, between the need for teaching and the need for counseling? Thank you for that question, because um, it's something that I, I, I don't think it was Senate education, it might have been House education that I addressed this um, earlier in my career. Um, we're fortunate um, at St. Johnsbury that we have people, like I mentioned, that, who would donate private monies to a, what we, to a fund that will help students in need. And part of that money um, helps to pay for um, on-site counselors for, um, for students who have social emotional needs. And those counselors also, um, we um, also have a network of care outside of the school that they have access to some partners um, in, in social work and social services and human services and youth services. Um, and so when a student is in trouble and I, can t I could tell stories from today, um, from my class today, um, when a student is in trouble, um, it's all hands on deck. Um, and everybody has a stake in that student's well-being. And so it's not, um, it's not siloed. It can't be siloed. And um, you, everybody's doing their part. Um, and sometimes one person has to take the lead. One organization or institution has to take a lead. But um, it's everybody's, in, everybody's um, involved in helping that student. Um, I think that the whole um, educational support team um, that's in... Um, um, in Act 173 uh, and the multi-tiered system of support gets to this kind of issue. Um, the, the, there's, a, there's a team discussing students who are falling through the cracks or who are in crisis and deciding who takes the lead on them. And I'll just say one more thing. Um, the community concern that I started in um, my first year's head is based on something that ha happened in the Washington DC area. And um, it fell apart in short because there was that kind of um, siloed um, 
approach to services. And that happens when money, when it was an atmosphere of or environment of scarcity, that's what happens. People want to get what they get. If you can somehow get um, the funding, um, then the wraparound services can happen. Uh, thank you. Can I ask one more question, Mr. Chair? Uh, so um, thank you for that. Uh, we all, I think the comment about scarcity is very much on target. Um, you also talked about uh, the fact that you're a convener and you like to listen to input and, but on the board, you're going to be called to make decisions on a regular basis. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the decision-making that you'll have to make as a board member? Yeah, um, which is why I wanted to mention my values so you knew where I was coming from, what base um, from which I would make my decisions. Um, I was um, I was head headmaster of one of the largest schools, um, maybe the most diverse schools in the state, um, which included a campus in Korea and um, some economic development work in, in the region. Um, it was a big job, so I didn't have any problem making decisions. Um, but making a, I always wanted to hear from the people who, who um, would know better than I about um, the specifics of the issue. Uh, but then uh, using um, as much wisdom and discernment um, based on my values, uh, I'm used to making decisions. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Lovett? If I could just answer uh, Senator Hooker's questions about process. Uh, yes, please. Um, so there was an application um, that I filled out. I had a bio and uh, sent in my CV. Um, I had talked with the, the governor and the governor's office over the years about education, um, was not called in for a specific interview this time, but did, um, did put in a, an application um, to not only uh, voice my interest, but also give some kind of biography and um, credentials. Okay, and, and if I may, Senator Campion, and was that based on something that you saw the opening was available? Was it, um, or had so you been? So I, I, as a member of the um, Act 173 um, funding committee, um, I've been aware of the board and actually I've been aware of the board and watching it um, since I was headmaster it was part of my my job. Um, so I knew that there were openings coming up, but to be honest, um, I didn't know about the exact timing until Representative Scott Beck um, okay. asked me if uh, if I was going to put my name in. Okay, thank you. So Beck is behind this, eh? Yes. <laughs> okay. I, I went in to buy a book and ended up applying to be on the board. Great guy. Great guy. <laughs> Be careful in those bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other final questions for Mr. Lovett? Mr. Lovett, thanks very much for being with us. We really very much appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate your dedication to uh, education uh, as well as public service and uh, look forward to con continuing the conversation and very much looking forward to working with you in the years to come. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the service you give to the state of Vermont and all of our students. Thank you. Mr. Jepson, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, boy, Tom, you're a tough act to follow. Um, well, I, I was just gonna, <laughs> gonna say um, that it might be tough, but we have the utmost confidence. We've heard great things. Uh, I know you have two senators uh, on this committee, Senator Hooker and Senator Terenzini, who regrets not being able to be here. You may have heard that he had some oral surgery and uh, otherwise would be here and has been a, a great member of this committee. So um, well, wanted to pass that along to you. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And it's great to see um, our Rutland delegation here with Cheryl leading that way. Um, and uh, I am glad that Tom took the tough question. So thank you for <laughs> throwing me the softballs later on. Um, if you looked at my resume that I did forward, you're gonna find that it's, um, you might say, well, Lyle, could you hold a job? And um, so I've gone from being a teacher in, at North Country Union High School to being a principal at Fairhaven to being a principal in, in an elementary school, um, but finally found my way. And I think Kevin probably told you the other day, 
found my way when uh, he helped me get into technical education at Stafford Technical Center, uh, where I was uh, a director for 16 years. And so I'm coming to you with a clear bias, and that bias is around CTE and making sure that we have clear pathways uh, from high school to tech centers to higher education. And so my background, I think, prepared me uh, for that, specifically being a high school principal and seeing how things operated there and then going to a tech center and seeing that there was a clear disconnect. And so my goal over the years was to try to eliminate some of the stereotypes that were associated with technical centers. And I didn't realize when I got that job that about 85% of my job was marketing and marketing to schools and students and to the public. So I spent about 29 years in public education, uh, ending at Stafford Technical Center, where I then went and became the Dean of Entrepreneurial Programs at Castleton University. We opened a downtown office here in Rutland with the goal of better connecting with the community. Uh, that morphed into working in economic development. Uh, Castleton took on a contract with Rutland Economic Development Corporation, and we, uh, in, I guess you could say, merged the two organizations. Um, as things change, as they always do, uh, financial considerations brought that merger to a close. And I spent a couple of years at uh, Vermont Tech working as the director of the Career and Technical Teacher Education Program. When a position came open to merge the Chamber and Economic Development, the Chamber of Commerce in Rutland and Rutland Economic Development Corporation, I was asked to come back and work on that merger, not realizing that I would be sitting in the swivel chair that I'm sitting in right now um, as the executive director. I just thought I was helping them put that together. So I've kind of, um, quite frankly, been in education my entire life because what I'm finding right now in economic development, it's about education and it's about looking into the future. And if you were to ask the question that you asked Tom a little while ago, well, what is it that I see my role being and what do I want to do on the state board? Um, I want us to look at what five and 10 years down the road looks like because COVID has taught us some things and it's taught us that we don't need to look like what we looked like before. And maybe hybrid education or remote education doesn't need to go away in many uh, situations. And so we need to look carefully at what education will look like five years from now, 10 years from now. And I was hoping that, that Kevin would actually be here because I wanted to talk about the equity piece. And when I'm in my current job right now, we're laser focused on trying to attract new people to Vermont, specifically to Rutland, but if not Rutland, then Vermont. And as we're doing that, we get questions from people. And we have a concierge service of 25 people of all different backgrounds. And the concierge people grab people that come in who are interested in learning more about Rutland County. The questions we get, as you might imagine, are about jobs, they're about housing, but they're also about education. They're not going to come to Vermont if education isn't quality. And the people that we're trying to attract are young people. They're the 25 to 35 year olds. And we're spending a lot of money doing that right now. But there's also, also another question that I get and I had a phone call from a gentleman in Chicago the other day, and I knew where he was going when he said, Lyle, when you walk out your office door, am I gonna be the only person of color walking down Merchant's Row? And so we had to have the conversation about what Vermont looks like. And so from that conversation, we're now starting at the Chamber in Economic Development, what I'm calling our essential journey. We have hired a, a consultant to do not just DEI training for our entire board, but we're also going to create a strategy. And that strategy is to make Rutland and Rutland County look like what we'd like it to look like in the future. And that's about being a welcoming place. And that's what our schools need to be. And I'm not sure they've always been as welcoming as we had hoped. And that's what I think we've heard the other senator who was here earlier, Keisha Ram, talking about. It's about feeling comfortable wherever you are. And right now there are people that do not feel comfortable being in public school or being in private school or wherever they are. So I want future students walking through the doors feeling 
comfortable and safe and learning in a quality way. And it's happening all over Vermont, but I think that we're hearing that it might not be equal everywhere. So we need to work on that. But when you look at me, I'm the age I am, the color I am, the experience I've had, I don't know what I don't know. And so that's why I'm gonna bring my board through training because I need to learn and we need to create what we want things to look like. So with that, what are my priorities? Equity, excellence, and affordability. And I come from a background where my father was a banker and we knew where every penny was. And we need to know where every penny is now. We're spending a lot of money for every student that we're educating. Is it sustainable? I'm not sure. So we need to look into that into the future and how we're going to be uh, sustain what we want things to look like. I have a daughter who's a teacher. I, Tom was talking about his background and what encourages him. Well, my daughter encourages me because she works in a special needs school. And she tells me about the backgrounds and the things going on with her students. And I love her for it. Sometimes I don't know how she does it every day but she smiles every day because she knows she's making a difference. And that's what we all want to do. So if I can make a difference, I'd love to do that. But I have to warn people, I come with a bias and it's about career and technical education. And it's about helping our employers find highly skilled people who can move our economy forward. And it's about how do we have that transition from elementary school to high school to tech centers to further education, whether that's college or not, how do we make that a clear pathway that's easy to access, that's affordable, so that we can just keep things moving in a positive way. So clearly not as articulate as Tom. Oh, I, just so. I thought that was great. Really open, great. open to the easy questions now. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Chittenden. So thank you very much, uh, Lyle, uh, for, for applying and for being willing to serve. Uh, my question has to do with the first thing I heard you say is your priority. And I don't know how much this intersects with the Board of, Edu of, uh, Board of Education, but um, I, in my role, in my three months here, I'd love for you to give me your thoughts on how do we achieve equity, which was your first priority, um, in a state that loves local and cherishes and um, very much protects local control. Um, how do we ensure that for all these school districts that want to have a lot of say over how they're uh, prioritizing their budgets, where they commit their resources, how do we as a state uh, strive for equitable access to educational opportunities while still distributing so much decision making to our local communities? Do you have any thoughts to expound upon how we achieve equity while still um, honoring the local control attributes that our fiercely independent Vermont communities um, cherish so much? And as a lifelong Vermonter, I shared that fierceness. Um, and, but I will say that children can't pick where they live and they can't pick where they're born. And so we need to help with the education part of that. And people may not like the answer that I give to this question, but we may, we either need to pay a whole lot of money so that we can have local control, or we need to give up some of that local control mm -hmm. so that we can have some, maybe a little more equity. There is a common, a middle ground there. And we, we can't continue going with the complete local control into the future if we expect it to be sustainable into the future. So that's my short answer. Great answer, thank you. And I think that the, the co combinations that have been happening of school districts, the reduction in the um, duplication of effort has got to continue. Look at Hawaii. Hawaii has one school district. Right, right. Manhattan has one school district. Yeah. Islands. <laughs> yeah. uh, I really welcome and I'm excited by your background in career and technical education. Uh, I believe my colleagues are as well. And you mentioned early on that there's still, we have to break something down there. You know, there's still this that's for some people, it's not for others. You know, honestly, I, I wish, I think I really could have benefited immensely from taking a couple of classes 
at a career and technical center in high school or or, or few class. And I think there are probably a lot of young people out there right now that either uh, are also maybe in the same boat. So could you say a little bit more about breaking that down and how we can let everybody know that this is for everybody and this is a huge asset that we have in our state? Yeah, and I don't want to sound like I'm repeating myself, but when I was a tech center director, 85% of my job was relationship building. And it was telling people what we were actually doing, not what they thought we were doing and working with employers. And when I wanted to put together a new program at Stafford Tech, I knew if I got my employers together that there was no stopping us because they needed the employees and they were gonna pay them well. And they would help us market the, the process and what the program had to offer. Um, it, it takes people working together. Tom said it a little while ago, it's pulling people together so that they know what the facts are and not what they thought the facts were. And it takes a long time to do that. And uh, Mr. Jackson, I think, I'm sorry to interrupt. Does yeah. that also mean the students? In other words, what gets, or maybe this is, maybe I misinterpreted or misunderstood the, the concern. Do you feel like there might be a, 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 a student in Rutland High School that uh, is really knows that not only is the the English class and the German class for him or her, but also a class at the technical, at the tech center also could be a, a spot for him or her. There are stumbling blocks that prevent students from accessing technical education. And that goes all the way from teacher contracts and when people get to work, how the buses run, when the bells ring, um, at my tech center long ago at Stafford Tech, we had seven different sending schools with seven different schedules, seven different arrival times. Um, there's no, quite frankly, there's no reason for that. I understand the reason, but I think we can, we can resolve those. I know that because the elementary school bus runs at a certain time, you can't get the high school kids to the tech center until a certain time. Um, but it seems like we should be able to, to resolve those issues, even having, a common calendar uh, with common times where teachers are doing common professional development would be exciting. Thank you, Senator Hooker, please. Thank you, and thanks Lyle for stepping up to serve on the board and for all the work that you've done certainly at the Technical Center here. I really appreciate Stafford and I appreciate your wanting to kind of break down the stereotype of the technical center. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, emphasis now on STEM and, and uh, tech ed and workforce development, which I certainly appreciate, but how do we continue to keep what's necessary of um, literacy and um, the arts and all of those things and meld them, breaking down these silos. So as Senator Campion said, every student realizes that everything is there for all of them. So, um, and I know that that is impossible because we, you know, I led three lives type thing would be good here, but um, I don't know that that's possible either. Well, you're referencing a personal learning plan and I'm not sure why a student can't do art in his welding lab. I saw some of the most beautiful work coming out of the welding lab, again, at Stafford Technical Center, sorry. Um, I don't know why that student couldn't get art credit for that, but there are certain stumbling blocks that keep students from doing that. And literacy, literacy quite frank, frankly, should be taught within whatever project is going on. And it does not need to be a separate standalone course. Um, easier said than done. Um, but I think there are ways to keep the literacy, the math and all going, which is what is essential because quite frankly, when a student comes out of a tech center, people would say, well, what'd you teach them at the tech center? And that, well, I didn't necessarily teach them to be a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter, but I taught them to be confident and I taught them that they have transferable skills and we taught them that literature, reading and writing and math are essential. I don't know if I answered your question or just talked around it, Cheryl. No, no, you do, I think. And it's, you know, learning across the curriculum and, you know, having math and art and literature and 
auto mechanics, you know, in everything that we do. Thanks. And I didn't answer your initial question um, about how I was asked to be involved in this. And I think how it evolved was one of my former students who now works at the Department of Labor asked the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, Joan Goldstein, to call me one weekend and say, would you ask him to do this? And uh, so she did. And uh, but she said, you have until Monday to decide. So <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take me long. All right. Thanks a lot. Any other questions uh, or comments for Mr. Jepson at this point? OK. Uh, Mr. Jepson, thanks so much for joining us. Very much appreciate all that you've already done uh, for Vermonters uh, through your work in our schools and now in your work in, with the Chamber and, and look forward to working with you going forward to uh, advance education in, in our great state. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you for the time. Committee, uh, Mr. Demaray, uh, see that you're with us ah there you are thanks i am jim would it work for you if we were to take a 10 minute break and then have a walk through on s114 oh are we great yeah great thanks all right then we'll come back